Okay, so that brings us on to uh, our second toast for the evening uh, in terms of, um, of, of moving it forward. And uh, we've got the uh, pleasure of Sean Adams uh, delivering that toast to the, uh, to the lassies. And it's interesting because there's a couple of stories here that go along with this. And the first one is that Jill and, and Sean, when they first got married, you know, there was like, quite a few arguments in the relationship. Oh. And so Jill phoned home and said to her mum, you know, that's it, he's fighting with me again, I'm coming home. And Jill's mum said, no, he must be made to suffer. <laughs> well, I'm coming to you. <laughs> but the, the, the counterpart of that is that a couple of weeks back, um, Sean received the text, and on the text, it actually said from Jill that she was in casualty. And Sean phoned me and he said, you know, he said, I've watched all 50 minutes of casualty tonight. I haven't seen it. <laughs> Sean, the floor is yours. <laughs> Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, President Mary, Rotarians, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my great honour this evening to be asked to propose a toast to all our lasses. It's an honour, yes, but uh, it's a dangerous one. Uh, as Peter has just alluded to, my own sulky, sullen dame is uh, here tonight, keeping a, a keen eye and a keen ear on everything I'm about to say. But never mind, um, never mind poor Tam Ashanter worrying about uh, Kate nursing her wrath from the safe distance of the booze, safe distance of the boozer. Uh, I'll be able to see the gathering storm from this front row seat that she's. However, <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, being from Ayrshire, just like Rabbi, I'm a man who likes to sail close to the wind. So purely for your entertainment, <laughs> I'll brave that danger tonight. And I promise that this will be the best toast to the lassies that you will hear tonight. <laughs> <laughs> now, as we know, Robert Burns lived his life to the full in his short 37 years, uh, having, depending on which account you believe, 12 or 13 children by four different women. He clearly had an eye for the ladies. In fact, if any lassie in Scotland said that you fancy a quickie rab, he normally said, aye. Now, however, how would he have got on if he'd lived to a ripe old age? Would he have maintained his standing with the ladies? I recently asked an elderly friend of mine, it was Ed Campbell. Uh, <laughs> when I say elderly, I mean older, an older gentleman. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what the secret of the continuing romance was, and he told me that every week, he and Scylla uh, went out for a nice meal in a good restaurant. He went on Tuesdays and Scylla went on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I didn't believe it because I told him that every time I saw him and his good lady in the thistles at Stirling, they were always holding hands and it really struck me as being really nice. But he told her that was just to stop her from going to the shops. <laughs> <laughs> and this infatuation with shopping is it's just one of the differences between women and men. Another is the way that, that women think. They don't seem to think in straight lines like men. And this is demonstrated by another true story that I heard recently from a doctor friend. Now, a lady visited him recently and um, she was not to beat about the bush. She was a wee bit out of shape. You know how women go, gents. They're not like us. They, they tend to let themselves go after a wee while. <laughs> So, tacti tactfully, my doctor friend advised her to do something each day for 20 minutes that would leave her out of breath. So she took up smoking. <laughs> <laughs> when, she when she returned to him worse than before, my friend suggested that maybe she should join a yoga class. But that didn't work out either. Apparently, when the instructor asked her how flexible she was, she said she couldn't make Mondays or Thursdays. <laughs> But luckily, luckily for that poor woman, and for all you lassies, we men folk are very good at being flexible. And we're always a making, making allowances for the angrier, more vindictive sex. 
just so we don't hurt your feelings. <laughs> we have to learn, and it's true ladies, we have to learn to handle you very carefully. Like unexploded bombs or rabbit ferrets. <laughs> and sometimes, gents, that takes some fast and creative thinking, doesn't it? And the ladies, I can see, need some evidence. So here's another true story. And it's a local story. It's from Dunblane. And some of it's a wee bit risky, so I won't mention uh, the people involved. So Rod and Louisa were having a dinner party. <laughs> Rod and Louisa were having a dinner party. It was for all the top folk in Dunblane, all the top names. And Louisa was very excited about this, as, as she would be. And she wanted everything to be absolutely perfect. And at the very last minute, she realised that she didn't have any snails for dinner. I'm sure you all know that Scottish snails have become a bit of a delicacy. Uh, and she didn't have any snails. And so, of course, she turned to Rod. And she asked him to grab his bucket and get out to this secret snail patch that they have somewhere out in the hills, out in the Lee Hills somewhere, to gather some. And Rod was a wee bit, very grudging uh, to start with. Um, he didn't want to be dragged away from the TV programme he was watching, which had just, just started. There was something about the world's greatest Welshman. Um, but he suddenly realised that they'd already done Max Boyce, so there couldn't be anything else of interest coming up. So he took the bucket, walked out the door, and out to the field. And Rod, we all know Rod. He's a bit of a raccoon too, he's a good looking man. And he's out there collecting the snails, and he noticed a very beautiful woman uh, walking along the hills, almost as beautiful as Louisa, but very beautiful women walking towards him, and he, he thought to himself, wouldn't it be great if she just come down and, I, I'm not going to do anything dirty, but wouldn't it be great if she came down and just had a wee chat with me? But putting such thoughts to his mind, he went back to his gathering of snails, and all of a sudden he looked up, and there, right in front of him, was this beautiful woman, and she started talking to him, and things kind of warmed up, and she invited him back to her place, which was just down the road. And they ended up in their apartment, and as Welshmen will, they started messing around, and things, in fact, get so hot and heavy that Rod com collapsed, exhausted afterwards, and passed out in her flat. At seven o'clock the next morning, he woke up and exclaimed, my goodness, Louisa's dinner party. So he gathered all his clothes, grabbed his bucket of snails, and ran quickly down the road. He was running so fast, actually, that when he got home, he tripped over the front step, the bucket went flying, the snails were everywhere, and of course the noise alerted Louisa who appeared at the door looking quite perturbed and a wee bit angry. And Rod did this quick thinking thing, he looked at the snails on the steps, he looked at Louisa, he looked back at the snails and said, come on guys, we're nearly there! <laughs> This is part of Robert Burns' secret. I think he was so versed in these wee thoughtful kindnesses. <laughs> that was why he was so successful with the lassies. And I'm sure that if he was able to think that quickly on his feet, he'd have got himself uh, into all sorts of hot, hot water with his various conquests. Of course, some of the women in his life weren't mere notches on his bedpost. He wrote this about his first love, Nellie Kilpatrick. Well, once I loved a bonny lass, ay, and I love her still, and while that virtue warms my breast, I love my handsome nail. And Burns later wrote about this rhyme, I never had the least thought or inclination of turning poet till I got once heartily in love, and then rhyme and song were in a manner the spontaneous language of my heart. I remember I composed it in a wild enthusiasm of passion, and to this hour, I never recollect it, but my heart melts, and my blood sallies at the remembrance. And as Jill knows, I've always used those words as an inspiration for my life with her. <laughs> I'm sure many of the gentlemen here are exactly the same, and just like me, uh, write spontaneous wee snatches of poetry for our women folk and leave them lying round the house, hoping they'll be discovered and elicit just a wee smile. And I believe only one other man in history has emulated Burns' ability to honour women with words. 
Like Burns, he was one of the, or he is one of the great political and social commentators of our time. It's not Sartre, it's not Dostoevsky or even Chomsky. I am, of course, referring to Homer J. Simpson. <laughs> who, when explaining the wonders of women to his young son, said, A woman is a lot like a beer. They look good, they smell good, and you'd step on your own mother, mother just to get one. And that, ladies, is a measure of just, just how much, just how much we truly love you. <laughs> we love you for your intelligence, your warmth, and your empathy. But mostly we love you just for putting up with us men. So gentlemen, please stand to your full heights, raise your glasses, and let's have a heartfelt, loving toast to all our lasses. To the lasses. To the lasses. 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 lasses.